Hi there, and welcome to week seven. Hi there, yes. Probability distributions is a serious topic. In fact, it is so serious and important that the prof over there brought in some heavyweight assistance. Indeed, and thanks for stepping in. You look serious, really professional. Well, of, of course, I mean, um, Dealing with uncertainty in decision-making is... It's not just about brains. It's about thinking on the fly. It is about curiosity. It is about common sense. Yes, it's partly art, partly science, and then just sometimes good old experience. <sighs> hey, you guys already started oh, without me. Look at you! All informal! How do you want anybody to take you seriously? He's just here to provide some balance. Yeah, it's, it's just confusing. I mean, the middle, you know, statistics, base, second year module, central limit theorem. Indeed. Come on. Come on. Hey, no touchy touchy. That's better. Yeah. Come on, indeed. Go, go. Go. Outlier. Now we are right skewed, right tailed. It's the same thing. Now you're just being mean. <laughs> mean. <laughs> mean. You get it? That's why the mean is such a dumb summary statistic. It is only worth something if you deal with a symmetric distribution. Like a normal yeah. distribution. It is symmetric around the mean. Not that there is anything normal about you. True. The only normal people are those we don't know very well. Now, now. Don't be mean. I mean, don't be median to me. Get out of here. Hey guys, what do you call this distribution? Spooky. Paranormal distribution. Ah, oh, you Get schmuck. out of here. Why don't you just move like two, three standard deviations to that side? Now you've manipulated the data. That wasn't very nice. I um, think you should go and fix it. Well, I hope my alter egos will be sorting themselves out. Let us carry on at least and look at today's class where I'm going to look at some key distributions. The normal, the Poisson, the exponential. And you might recall that the assignment that you were asked to complete before watching this lecture is actually based on the Poisson and the exponential distributions. We will also look briefly at the power law as well as the uniform distribution. So far in engineering statistics, you were always given the distribution. You were always given the equations, the parameters of those distributions. But now in this module, you are only given the data and you have to start with the data. It's not known what the distribution is. So how do you find a distribution? At this point, it's important to note the data is not hiding a distribution from you and your goal is to try and find that particular distribution and its parameters. We just use probability distributions to often describe the data in some useful way. And the reason for that is, or should be straightforward, is that the data often only represents a very small sample. But we want to make 
fairly accurate decisions about the population as a whole. And then it's sometimes dangerous to just work with a small sample. It's better to fit your data or fit a distribution to the data and then use that estimated distribution to answer your real questions. Now, <clears throat> luckily in base R, for most of the common distributions, there are some standard functions. For the normal Poisson exponential uniform distribution, as we've shown here, there are functions that deals with density and distribution. Density uses a prefix of D, but here it might be confusing because density actually refers to the probability density function. And the probability might suggest that we want to use P as a prefix, but we don't. Base R has chosen D. The cumulative distribution function actually gives you a P prefix because it calculates an entire probability up to a specific point. The third function that is of interest is the quantile function where you give it the probability and it will actually give you the actual quantity associated with a particular probability. The fourth function is the random number generator and this is useful if you want to generate your own random numbers for any distribution. You tell it how many numbers you want to generate and what the distribution parameters are and it will generate the random numbers for you. So let's look at a simple process. Parts arrive at a drill, a hole is drilled in each part and the hole is then inspected. Holes that have a diameter of 10 centimeters plus or minus 0.5 centimeter tolerance are actually within specification. And this might ring a bell from an earlier week's work that we've done. Now, if I tell you that parts arrive about one minute apart and that the drilling and inspection takes about one minute, I might actually ask a question like, how long do you think it takes to complete one product in its entirety, the drilling, the inspection and the arrival, all of it together? Or I can ask how many parts do you think we can process per hour? Now, if you only look at the about value, you typically work with the mean values and you might say, well, it seems that we can actually do um, roughly about 60 parts per hour. But you can actually be quite wrong because the uncertainty associated with arrivals and the uncertainty associated with the drilling and inspection typically follows very different distributions. So let's look at the normal distribution. And this is something that you might be familiar with by now, drawing a histogram of machines drilling holes. And in this particular frequency diagram or histogram, we've used more samples out of the hole drilling example that we did in a previous week. So you see on the y-axis uh, the frequency, typically fairly high numbers, and the hole diameter. So probability distributions and frequency distributions are useful if we describe only one parameter, only one variable, which in this case is the hole diameter. That is our value x. So if X is the drill hole diameter for machine two, then there's a very concise and eloquent way that we can describe that random process. We say that X is estimated by a normal distribution and we use the capital N to suggest a normal distribution. And then we can actually provide the two parameters because the normal distribution uses two parameters. It uses the mean, mu, and the standard deviation, sigma which you've used quite extensively, I believe, in your statistics course as well. Now, <clears throat> all holes smaller than 0.95 and bigger than 10.5 do not meet our specifications. And if we use the distribution function of the hole sizes, this normal distribution or bell-shaped curve, how can we determine the fraction of holes that will not meet specification? In the earlier work that we've done in this course, we simply calculated the proportions. We calculated how many items did not meet it. But that was based on only 
20 or 30 holes that we've drilled, a very small sample. So in statistics, if you know what these parameters of the, of the distribution are, you could have calculated the z-score. Now recall that the z-score tells you a particular value, how many standard deviations away from the mean is it? Right, so in this particular case, if you substitute the values into the correct equation, you calculate the z-score to be minus 1.46. Minus indicates it's towards the left of the mean, and 1.46 indicates it's 1.46 standard deviations away from the mean. Then in order to answer the question, you can calculate the probability that the z-scores of points or the holes that we've drilled will be less than this particular z-score of minus 1.46. We can look it up in the tables and actually say, ha, huh, the value is roughly about 0 0.07, which implies a 7% chance of drilling holes that are too small. The good thing is there's a one-liner that you can do this in R using the p-norm function, the cumulative distribution. And this is useful because it, similar to the tables, gives you the area towards the left of a particular value. And I say towards the left because there actually is an argument that we will set later called lower dot tail. And if you look at the help function of, of or the help documentation of these functions, you will actually read more about the arguments. But it assumes by default that you're interested in the value towards the left, the cumulative probability. So P norm, we give it the quantile or the quantity, 9.5. We give it the mean, the standard deviation of our sample data, and we say, calculate the probability for me. And lo and behold, go and substitute that in and see what it actually calculates. All right, now in terms of the frequency diagram, it is exactly the same as the density. It's just an argument that you can set in the histogram function, but the value of drawing the density, the shape of the of the diagram does not change at all, but it allows you to draw the density function that you've estimated on top of your empirical data, which is the histogram, so that you can get an idea of how good is your fit, your estimate on the actual empirical data. So what are the key features of the normal distribution? It's symmetric and it's unimodal. Symmetric means if I were to balance the graph on its mean and I spin it around, it will kind of keep looking the same all of the time. Right, so we call it rotationally invariant or symmetric. What's to the left of the mean is the same as what's to the, to the right of the mean. And it has two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. It's very common due to the central limit theorem. And it's also overrated when, de when describing processes, meaning if something is uncertain, it does not necessarily mean it is normal. The central limit theorem says that if I am interested in any metric in a sample of data, and I want to calculate, but is that metric actually representative of the population? And I calculate that metric for many samples my estimate for the population metric will follow a normal distribution. And we will look at that later on in this, in this course as well. And you've calculated these things in, in engineering statistics. But the random process for which we calculate the metric does not have to follow the normal distribution for the central limit theorem to actually apply. So we can calculate the mean or the lambda of an exponential distribution, for example, and our estimate will still follow a normal distribution. But the, the distribution from which we gathered the metric, that can follow any distribution. It doesn't even have to follow a pretty distribution that we have a name for. So next, let's, let's have a look at the Poisson and the exponential distribution on which the assignment that you were asked to do before this lecture is actually based on. So now we describe X as the number of customers arrive at a service counter during any given minute. 
in the assignment we said how many people are coming through the door in a minute. So x is then best estimated by Poisson or you can just use POIS but there's one parameter lambda which is what we call the rate parameter. So what is the probability that there will be more than four customers arriving in any particular minute if the rate parameter lambda is three? Well, again, there's a one-liner in R that is PPOIS. We're interested in the quantity four or more. So now we actually pass the lower dot tail equals false option because we don't want to rely on the lower side or the default value. We're actually interested in the right-hand side because we're interested in four or more arriving per minute, and we can calculate it as 18%. All right, so this is typically what a Poisson distribution looks like. And this is the frequency diagram, but we can also draw the density diagram, and then we can overlay our estimated function on top of that. And this is useful to actually see, but ha, huh, okay, it's a pretty good fit. My orange line, which is my estimate, looks very similar. Some places I'm overestimating a little, other places I'm underestimating, but I get it pretty right most of the time. So what's the key features of a Poisson distribution? It's unimodal, it has one bump, and it is right skewed or right tailed. What is very important is it is a discrete distribution. Either three people are coming through the door in a minute, or two people. I can't have 2.3 people. Right, at some point I need to count the number of individuals. So the Poisson distribution is a discrete distribution. That is why I used little dots on my estimate on the density graph for the Poisson. And it only has one parameter, which is the rate parameter, lambda. Now it's interesting to note that as lambda increases, the distribution starts to look like the normal distribution. And we will see how later in this course you can kind of evaluate quantitatively how good your distribution actually is. It's very commonly used to model the arrival rate and the number of events in a given time span. If that's what you're after, the Poisson distribution is typically what you will use. Other examples include the number of machine breakdowns per hour, the number of armed conflicts per century, or the number of earthquakes per decade. In our assignment, it was the number of individuals walking through the door per minute. So what are important questions that we can ask here, or that you may ask at this point is, how do we measure the arrival rate and this lambda value? First is, you need to pick a time unit within which you want to measure this. Per minute, per hour, per week, per month, per decade. And then if you're interested to calculate the rate parameter, you take your observations, for example, the number of people walking through the door per minute. If you take the mean value, which is what we asked in the assignment, that will actually give you the lambda parameter. Because for the Poisson distribution, the mean is the lambda parameter. So how is this similar or related to the exponential distribution. And here you actually see a figure of the exponential distribution, which is also something that you already might be familiar with. And here we actually explain the data, or we concisely write it as, if x is set as the time, for example, in minutes, between customers arriving at a service counter. Again, time plays a role. <coughs> And now we can actually say that x is best estimated by x and the, the parameter for the exponential distribution is lambda. The same is for the Poisson distribution. A question that we can answer using the exponential distribution is if we expect three customers to arrive per minute, what is the expected inter-arrival time? between the customers. So now I give you lambda is three per minute. How long do you think it'll take between consecutive 
customers arriving? And the answer is 1 over 3. And that is exactly how we calculate the mean for the exponential distribution. We can answer a question like, what is the probability of a new customer arriving at least 0.33 minutes after the current one? And there's a one-liner in R where we use the cumulative probability, Pxp. We give it the quantile, the actual value, 0.33. We again are interested in the right side, so we say lower dot tail equals false. And we can calculate the 37% probability of of new customers arriving at least 0.33 minutes after the current one. All right, frequency diagram, the same as the density diagram, but the density diagram allows us to visualize our estimated function on top of our empirical data. And here again, we see that we get it pretty right. So we're happy with our estimate. So what are the key features of our exponential distribution? It's unimodal, it only has this one steep area, kind of the bump, and it is right skewed or right tailed. And nice thing, it only has one parameter. And it's the inverse of the Poisson distribution. Now, in the assignment we asked you to calculate the time or to record the time between arrivals in seconds. I want you, and I'll demonstrate this towards the end of this video, to convert that time in seconds to minutes. And then you can actually compare the two lambda values that you calculate using the time between arrival and the number of arrivals per minute. So we have to make sure if we want to compare the lambda values, we have to make sure that we use the same, the same unit of, of time. The other important thing that you have to remember is that the mean for the Poisson distribution is lambda, but for an exponential distribution, the mean is one over lambda. And it is very common to use this to measure time between arrivals. The, the time between consecutive machine breakdowns, the time between armed conflicts, or the time between earthquakes, so the same type of thing that we measure with the Poisson distribution. But if you measure things and you need to count them per decade, it'll take you a couple of decades worth of observations before you can actually fit a Poisson distribution. If you, however, measure the time between events, you can much quicker get enough observations that you can start estimating a distribution from. So we find that very often it is simpler to measure the time between arrivals and using an, an exponential distribution. So how do you do that? You capture the actual timestamps of when people are arriving or whatever it is that you're measuring the, the arrivals for. And then for consecutive values, you calculate the time between arrival. One value, timestamp, minus the timestamp of the previous uh, observation. So you'll note that if you have 100 timestamps, you can only calculate 99 time between arrival values because for the first observation, you will not have a previous value that you can refer back to to calculate the time between arrivals. And then once you've got those time between arrival values, you can simply calculate the mean, take the inverse, and that will give you your rate parameter lambda. Right, now the power law distribution. This is a very beautiful graph that was generated a couple of years ago by Dr. Elias Willemse working on a project for a nursery where they wanted to evaluate what gives them bang for their buck. What are the key most important things and plants that they actually sell? It turns out <clears throat> that this nursery is actually in the logistics business. Their deliveries is their number one stock keeping unit or SKU. It contributes the most towards its annual sales volume. Then there's compost, there's bark, and it's only the fourth item that is actually a plant. And this is a very good example of a power law distribution. It was just ordered in such a way that the lowest annual sales are on the left hand side. 
In the work that we've been doing in our research group, we've been studying the movement of vehicles. And what we realize, similar to what we see in social media, take for example your Instagram or your Facebook account, you can check how many connections you have with different individuals. We call that your degree. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of evidence that actually shows that some individuals have incredibly many contacts and share many connections with other individuals. But the majority of people actually have very few connections in their network. And similarly, when we track the movement of commercial vehicles and we see which facilities are connected with one another and how are these facilities connected via trucks, we see the similar type of patterns. If a truck goes from one company to another company or one building to another building, we assume that there's some social relationship between those two facilities. It may be coincidental. It may just happen that one company was on the milk run to, uh, for, for the deliveries on the activity sequence. But as you study more and more vehicles over a longer period of time, you see beautiful patterns actually emerging in terms of these social networks, or what we also call social graphs, or complex networks. And we've studied that for commercial vehicles, and we've identified the same type of phenomena, where there are a few of these businesses or facilities with very, very many connections to other facilities, and then there are a huge number of facilities with very few connections that are actually quite isolated. So this is typically in a supply chain network what the connections or the number of contacts or the degree actually looks like and the type of questions that we can kind of answer relates to what is often referred to as the Pareto principle. So 20% of our data is responsible for 80% of the output. And very often this is kind of referred to as the 2080 principle or the 3070 principle, but there's actually distributions behind it. I say here that we seldom find it in empirical data because it actually deals with what we call extreme value theory, but it has some really important practical applications. We just happen to be interested a lot in power laws and we find them a lot in terms of networks and connectivity among individuals and among firms. But it's something that you just need to be cognizant of and if you stumble across it, be careful how you actually estimate them. Where it is useful is that it means that 20% of your points dominate the entire process. So it is useful sometimes if you're interested in identifying those points or those stock keeping units or those customers that are really problematic. How do you identify them, right? The same in university. 20% of students often are responsible for 80% of the complaints, believe it or not. And we can actually map that if we're interested and describe it with a power law distribution. Right, so what are the key features of a power law? It's unimodal, similar to the exponential distribution. It has this one upright bump, but it has a very long and a thick tail. And it's very commonly used to identify important stuff for you to actually focus on, like top selling products, the top customers and clients, the top movers in a warehouse. 80% of your turnaround or your volume moved in a warehouse comes from 20% of your items. So it's a nice distribution to use to actually work with, to work with if you want to identify important items. And you might be tempted to actually fit an exponential distribution to it. But here I actually show on the density diagram the orange line, which is the scale-free or the Pareto law. And if we were to erroneously fit an exponential distribution, that is where it will actually occur. And you can clearly see here that on the lower end of the number of contacts, we completely underestimate um, using an exponential distribution. And in the area of about 20 to 50, we completely overestimate the number of contacts. So in this particular case, the, the number or, or using the exponential distribution will be pretty bad. So how do we find out if something follows a power law? 
Well, one way is to order your observations in a decreasing order based on whatever the metric is that you want to, to plot. And then you find the 20th percentile and you calculate the cumulative value of the metric that you're interested in. And see whether it roughly about rep uh, represents 80% of your overall uh, cumulative value. There's a more rigorous way of actually doing this in R, and there's an entire package dedicated to the power law. Um, but I would consider this more of an advanced topic and not something that you need to look at too much right now. Be cognizant of it. And then finally, let's look at the uniform distribution. In this example, we look at the annual income of workers in of warehousing staff, and we can again draw a histogram and here, the way in which we actually describe it is to let X be the annual income of our, tell our tellers, and it is best explained by a uniform distribution, and we use the capital letter U, and it has two parameters, namely the minimum and the maximum value. So we can ask a question like, what is the probability of a teller actually earning less than 201,000 Rand in this particular warehouse? Again, there is a one-liner in R that we can use, P, which is the probability or the cumulative distribution function. We give it the quantity or the quantile value, which is 201,000 Rand. Give it the estimated parameters of our distribution, and it'll calculate that there is a 10% chance. Now, <clears throat> again, frequency or the density. The latter, again, allows us to visualize the estimated function. So it's one thing to tell somebody, I've estimated the following probability distribution and these are the, the parameters. It's a different thing and a lot more convincing if you can actually draw the density di diagram on top of your empirical data, of your actual observations in terms of your frequency or your histogram. Right, so what are the key uh, features of a uniform distribution? It's unimodal, there's only kind of this one bump, and it's also symmetric around if you calculate the mean. It has two parameters, the minimum and the maximum. But it's actually very rare to observe this in practice. And we also call this the no-knowledge distribution, or the we-don't-know distribution. Because in, in the absence of anything else, people might just say, you know, it's, it's somewhere between some minimum value and some maximum value. And I don't know anything more than that. And very often, it's, we don't have a very good idea on how to decide between these extreme values, the max and the min. Uh, the problem is that we assume that all of the values are then the same between these two extreme values. The probability is equal across that entire range, and it is zero outside of that range. In that sense, there are other distributions that might be more appropriate. The one that we highlight right at the bottom is the triangular distribution, where you can say there's a minimum value, there is a most likely or a mode value, and there is a maximum value but it's not uniform in terms of the probability in between. But there are others. There are beta, binomial, Cauchy. There's a whole list of them that we won't spend any time on specifically. Suffice to say that your data is not hiding the correct one from that list. Your job is to be able to find an appropriate one. So how do you go about doing that? Well, the crude way is just draw a histogram of your sample data and see what distribution seems likely. This is really just eyeballing it and saying, well, it, it looks like a normal distribution or a uniform distribution. And then estimate that particular distribution's parameters using your sample data and then calculate the percentiles. Overlay your estimated function on your empirical data to see how well it actually fits. Where do you overestimate? Where do you actually underestimate? Later in this module, we will introduce the chi-square test to show you how you can quantitatively use hypothesis tests to actually evaluate how good your model is. But that's for later in the course, once we've introduced hypothesis tests, 
For now, you need to deal with the uncertainty and the vagueness, but use your data, be comfortable with your data, and start with the histogram.